Hello and welcome to Self Publishing Insiders with Draft to Digital. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I'm the Director of Business Development at Draft to Digital. And I'm I'm honored to have with me in the virtual studios uh, Tish Morris. Uh, so, Tish, uh, welcome to welcome to the um, the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So can you share with my authors, uh, I know uh, Kevin Tomlinson uh, and you connected uh, at in person uh, at a writer's conference. And after Kevin heard you speak, he said, we have to we have to have you come on the show. We have to have you share all of the great stuff that you're doing. But can you first start by giving our listeners, our viewers, uh, a little bit of a background uh, about yourself? Absolutely. Um, um, oh, a little feedback. All right. Can you hear me OK? All right. Um, so, uh, so yes, I, um, I'll start with the end, end of the story and then I can backtrack. I'm an entertainment, um, publishing and entertainment lawyer based in LA. And, um, I've been doing this for a few years. I'm also a uh, published author, self-published and traditional published author. Um, also had a self-publishing business for, 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 uh, in the, in the interim while I was taking the California bar, um, not sure. I wasn't sure which way that would go. It, it went in a positive direction finally. Um, uh, because I'm originally from Tennessee and I got my start in Tennessee in music city, USA. Um, that's where I'm originally from. And, um, I was a lawyer there and then I took a strange pivot into the healing arts and became a feng shui, um, expert and, uh, which is really random and that's all for another podcast of really what that is. Um, but what it did, it gave me opportunity to write books. And that's really at the heart of, 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 of all the thread line through my career is of being a writer and, um, and being an author. And I, I love being here with you guys because I have such a love for publishing, the publishing business. Um, and I have a great respect for self-publishing and have a great respect for traditional publishing. All of it's great. I'm all about helping people get their stories out. And so... For today, I want to um, help help the self-publishing authors with any legal issues that you um, that you might encounter, or maybe you don't even know that you what you don't know. So I'd like to um, see. And of course, um, feel free to put any questions you'd like specifically, because legal issues can be pretty pretty broad. And I want to make it as simple as possible for you guys. I think uh, I think you might be frozen, Mark. Uh, so I will uh, keep. Okay, you unfroze. All right, I'll I'll keep talking. So um, so again, feel free to put your comments in the uh, questions um, for me, and I'm happy to address any legal issues um, that you might have. Thank you. Um, I, and I warned Tisha before we went live that I am at a hotel. I'm, I'm, I'm on the road with draft to digital and, and sometimes the Wi-Fi in a hotel room is not necessarily great. So thanks for, for covering uh, there. <laughs> Be, um, I, I did want to ask, so what are some of the most common, what are some of the most common things that writers aren't aware of when, yeah. when it yeah. comes to the legalities of, of publishing? Yeah, because, you know, what, why I really wanted to talk to this, to this um, audience is because it's self-publishers and, and we as self-publishers have to think about legal issues that a traditional publisher already takes into account. They have a legal team or they either have an in-house uh, uh, legal or they hire out legal, um, but they're usually taking care of those issues um, for their authors and, or they might not even, you know, sign a book because it's laden with legal issues. So that's um, important to know either either route you go. And so you have to be your own kind of um, legal department. <laughs> and so uh, these issues are all about, these are all First Amendment issues. Um, First Amendment is our, you know, right to speech. Um, and so books are ultimately fodder for First Amendment considerations. And so the big one that comes up are these right to privacy issues, particularly defamation. Um, and we can get into the nuances of those if we want to just go ahead and dive in. Um, but it, it comes up a lot in memoir, um, nonfiction. It, it still applies to fiction just because you change someone's name and say it's based on a true story doesn't get you off the hook. We can talk more about that, but I'm going to stick with just the nuts and bolts of, of um, what defamation looks like, um, again, particularly in nonfiction and memoir. 
Well, I'm also curious, not just for memoirs, but when you write real people in a fictional setting, does that have repercussions in, in a legal sense? That's right. It, it does, or it can. Um, so the, the criteria that you want to look for is identifiable. That's kind of the, the, the legal word. Um, is someone identifiable? And so even though you say um, not, even if you say it's fictionalized, um, you can see this even in TV of, you know, uh, CSI stories ripped from the headlines. Um, and it's like, oh, wow, that was taken exactly from that news story about so-and-so who murdered so-and-so or whatever the case is. And um, so even though it's like fiction, we know it's like, oh, that, this is like based on like real stuff. So our books can do that as well. And so that's, do you want to um, make your people not identifiable? And so that means changing names, changing hair color, changing as much as you can of their identifiable characteristics, um, even a little bit of the storyline, perhaps, if, again, if this is fiction, um, so that there is nothing that, so that's not identifiable. Okay. So that's, that's the key word identifiable in nonfiction. Um, you gotta, it's a, it's, it's walking a fine line because if you change it, it the, the criteria is all about truth. Are you, is, is what you're saying truthful? Um, so you don't want to change stuff up too much. You don't want to make your ex-husband, you know, a, um, a attempted murderer, <laughs> um, unless he was a charge with attempted murder, and then you can do it because that's actually truth and it's a, on a, on a, on record. Um, so, so there's some nuances there of you either want to go all the way with the truth or you want to like steer all the way or away from the truth and completely change things up. Um, I love that. So you mentioned uh, CSI earlier as, as a, a very ripped from the headlines uh, television show. Now, they obviously have a legal department that probably looks over their scripts, make sure they're not going to get NBC or whoever's producing it into trouble. Um, but you also have, I mean, uh, authors aren't on their own. You offer a course, for example. I think the course is called Legal Vetting Your Manuscript for uh, Red Flags. Yep. Um, so what are, what, are, what are some of the some of those red flags? We talked about the, the truth. We talked about identifiable. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that writers need to be very cautious about? Yeah. So yeah. defamation is is about truth, whether you're saying something that's not truthful. But at the same time, you have to work, uh, watch for some right of privacy issues. There, it's called different things in different states. Um, sometimes it's called um uh, right of privacy or some, some variation of right of privacy. And so that's actually when you tell the truth, but it's about things that are too private to be, to be, um, newsworthy, so to speak. And so this has to do with, um, anything having to do with diseases, uh, sexual, uh, things, um, things that would really harm someone's reputation or, 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 basically saying things that are like just not really appropriate to where it could be embarrassing, highly embarrassing. Um, so even so with defamation, we're going with the truth, but you're stepping in little minefields. If you start talking about some stuff that's extremely private and is not, um, uh, not, uh, well, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, legal criteria is there's a reasonable expectation of privacy um, that we all have. And so if you start going into these areas in other people's lives and don't get me wrong, these things can be some, sometimes, you know, since it, like make good stories of someone's sex life or something, but that's where you start really, um, getting and just walking into minefields. And that, and that goes beyond that, um, you know, um, client, doctor, patient, lawyer, pa lawyer, client, privilege, mm -hmm. uh, priest, uh, that, that sort of thing. Like that goes beyond that reasonable expectation of privacy into everyday relationships, right? That's right. That's right. But you, um, that reminds me that it was something, another thing, if, if there's any kind of um, non-disclosure agreement um, involved, that's something to be mindful of. I've had some clients who had a non-disclosure agreement with, like with a hospital and her book was about you know, had aspects of malpractice in it. So be mindful if you have any NDAs um, at play. This was actually the basis of um, when um, Donald Trump sued um, Mary Trump, trying to get her book from not coming out because of um, these right of privacy issues. 
but it actually had to do with an NDA. It actually didn't have to do with defamation or her, whether she was telling the truth or not. It had to do with whether she was violating, violating um, an NDA. So if there's any non-disclosure agreements anywhere lurking in your, in your world, um, really read that and see what it's, what, what you're not allowed to say. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I like that. Are there, are there any, um, I'm not going to say mechanical issues related to a manuscript that are in that list of things writers should be wary of? Um, uh, mechanical, uh, like copyright trademark, we know, should we go, go into those issues? Well, it, it is, um, quoting things, stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I was, uh, I was going to make a joke of, uh, mechanical issues of like, uh, uh the Oxford comma, <laughs> that, <laughs> um, uh, legal, legal, uh, implications of an Oxford comma. No. Um, so there, you know, obviously plagiarism, obviously that's off the table. Um, no one wants to get plagiarized. Um, as far as, uh, quotes, um, it's whether something's, um, fair use in the public domain. So now we are talking about copyright, um, copyright and trademark issues, um, that could be in, in the, in your manuscript, um, when it comes to the actual words in your, in your book, we're talking about copyright. So, um, if you, if you use a huge chunk of someone else's work, um, it's all about how, what, how much of something you're using. Um, if it's a huge chunk of someone else's work, you would definitely want to get their permission. If it's just a quote and it's a small portion, then you're okay. Um, so this was actually an issue in um, a documentary um, regarding, um, oh, shoot, what's the director? Woody, uh, 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 Woody Allen. Wait, is that the right name? I'm suddenly thinking about Woody Harrelson. Um, Woody, uh, the, there was a documentary, and it was based on a book um, that uh, Skyhorse um, published, and they were using huge chunks of Skyhorse's um of Woody's uh, book with Skyhorse and they were using it in an HBO documentary and they never got permission to use these big chunks. And so they, um, Skyhorse sued HBO. It was settled. So we don't know how the courts would have ruled on that, but they were using way more. So that was a copyright infringement um, without getting permission from Skyhorse. And so obviously these are big, you know, publishers and streamers going on here, but these are the same issues that can happen with just an everyday book, if you're using big chunks of someone else's work, then that violates copyright. Thank you. And my apologies to be interviewed by a disappearing interviewer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and for example, quoting or quoting from song lyrics or poems, there's a different issue with that? Yeah, so song lyrics is another animal, um, separate, uh, separate, similar but slightly different. Um, song lyrics are off the table, okay, unless you get the rights from the publisher of those song lyrics. Um, you you have to um, get a license to use song lyrics from use it like ASCAP, but BMI. Those this, the public. We had to research, see what publisher holds those rights, and get a license from in order to use those lyrics. So that is a big, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because that's a big red flag. Um, you can use the song title, the song titles are okay to use. Um, if the song title, if the uh, song, if the lyrics have, have the title in it, then you, there's that, that's kind of a workaround you could use. Um, uh, but don't make it in a lyrical, don't write it as a lyric, write it as a song title. Um, I've seen books that the whole thing is based around, like each chapter based around a song lyric, and um, and, and and these actually music publishers are likely are, are more likely to go after you than um, than uh, other authors if you're using using work. Um, they're pretty they're pretty uh, they pr look over their lyrics pretty pretty closely, and you know with with self publishing you might like well no one's gonna who's gonna really see that well. 
if you're self-publishing, you want a lot of people seeing it, right? So you don't want to have your own set up your own blocks of selling your, your work or have reasons why you don't want a lot of eyes on your work. So these are, you know, we can easily get, kind of be our, get in our own way um, sometimes of like, well, no one's, you know, not enough people are going to read, identify my ex-husband, so it should be fine. Well, that's really not the way you want to go about it. You want, you want thousands and if not you know, hundreds of thousands of people's of eyes on this work. Um, and yet the, the uh, catch me too is the more eyes and the more, more opportunity there is for uh, someone to get mad at you. I'm going to point out, uh, there's, a, there's a comment from Roderick who said, awesome topic. I have had a few thoughts about it. So Roderick, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to ask. I see a couple of you have already asked questions. We're going to get to those questions in just a second. But before we go there, um, uh, Tisha, I want to kind of take you over to something because I was on your website earlier today, uh, and that's uh, tishamorris.com. And I was looking at, you've got a book coming out. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Because I'm really curious. You're doing some really cool stuff with the book launch. I'd love for other writers to see what, what you're up to and, and, and why. Thank you. Um, so the book is called Missing, Missing Element, Hidden Strength. And it's based on, um, thank you. Yeah, there's the, the cover for those who are seeing it on, um, on video. Um, it's a culmination of, of everything I've done so far in my career, which is, which is varied, <laughs> varied all over the place. Um, so I take the five elements, which are based in Taoism. Um, the five, five elements is actually the creative process um, of life, life, um, birth, life, birth, death, rebirth, and the, the cycle of, of all living things. But it's also the cycle, the creative cycle. It is the cycle of you get an idea suddenly out of nowhere. I mean, all of us are creatives in this room um, by virtue of being authors, and I'm sure other, uh, many of you have other creative talents as well. You get that idea, that spark out of nowhere, seemingly. That is what is called the water phase in um, Dabism. And then when you start actually putting that those ideas onto paper or into your computer or whatever that looks like, that's the wood phase. When you actually start producing whatever, like really uh, going into the process big time and yeah, whether it's a book, you've got your 60,000 words in your manuscript, that's the fire phase. Once you hit that phase, you kind of rest, you pause, you reflect, you like <laughs> need some time because you're burnt out from the fire phase. That's the earth earth element phase. And then you go and like, what do I need to revise? What do I need to edit? What do I need to move around? That's the metal phase. And then you finish the project and you're back in the water. So it's a big circle. And so this is actually what a, a formula, so to speak. If there's ever a formula to create, um, this is the formula. And so we each have a, uh, our own, we, we all have the five elements within us, but we, there's one that we're dominant in. So there's one of those phases I just mentioned in which is your, your go-to. I'm a wood element, so I'm a quick starter. I start a lot of things. Um, it's harder for me to uh, complete or go into the fire. Um, so that's what I call my weak element, my missing element. And it's that missing element is where your hidden strength lies. Um, and so you all, I'm sure everyone here is, we've all accomplished things, don't get me wrong, but there's that somewhere in that process where your edges start to get a little, or your feathers get a little ruffled. Um, you run up against some, uh, maybe your negative thoughts. Um, maybe you put the project aside for a while, wherever the case is. Um, so identifying where in that process is your kind of Achilles heel. And uh, the book gives you ways of kind of embracing that element so that's not such this albatross that continues to get in your way. So that is, in a nutshell, the book. There's a quiz in it to where you can see what your, um, your primary element is, what your missing element is. I also have a quiz. The quiz is actually on my website now um, at tishamorris.com. You can uh, check that out, and it gives you a breakdown of all your elements and what each of those really mean as far as your personality. So, um, so that, that's, that's, that's it. It's, it's a fun book. It's, it's a really personal development book and, but I hope it, I hope a lot of creatives um, find it useful. No, I, I love that because understanding yourself as a creative and where your strengths lie. I think those tools are, are wonderful resources for writers. Now, now you are launching the book. It's coming out in November of 2022, correct? 
Um, but you've got two different dates. You've got two different sort of launch things that are going on that I, I just love to dig into and, and how you're doing it and, and, and why you're doing it that way. Yeah. So so I'm going to release NFTs um, pre, pre-launch pre moving into the, um, the launch of the book. The book actually la- uh, releases November 8th, which is uh, it's being traditionally published. So I don't that's one of the, the uh, negatives of traditional publishing. You don't get to pick your publishing date, which I would have never picked. November 8th, because do you know what November 8th is? The craziest election day on earth. Um, <laughs> so so this is why the week before is when I'm really going to be in a push. Um, and so part I'm going to um, kick it off with an NFT, uh, minting some NFTs. So for each of those elements I mentioned, there's going to be an NFT for, and each of those NFTs um, will c- contain exclusive content. Um, I'm working, I'm still working on that, what that exclusive content is, um, but all will, uh, but things such as um, my book proposal, um, some of the behind the scenes of, of work of, of uh, what led to my writing of this book. And um, this is my fifth book. So I have some other books in the hopper and I have other material. Uh, I'll probably give away some courses. Um, and so all this leads to the launch party that, that everyone uh, hopefully will attend on IG Live and Facebook Live, and it will be on November 7th. But all these dates um, are on my website. Signed up for the NFT um, launch. Um, basically, uh, it, it's a free event. And a lot of it will be just kind of me explaining what NFTs are. Um, as an entertainment lawyer, you know, everything is all these areas really bleed in, in all the different medias that are available for creatives. And so I've, I've, uh, I'm up to speed on the NFT world as much as when one can right now, there's a lot of intellectual property issues that are fodder for attorneys to, uh, to um, argue about. Um, so, so anyway, I wanted to, in order for me to learn something, I usually like just do it myself and figure it out that way. And so that's what I'm, I'm doing with these, this NFT launch, um, with these, uh, coins. My coins are being designed right now by an NFT designer and uh, looking forward to to those coins and they'll be available on OpenSea starting on November 1st. Um, so I'll have a number uh, for five days each day. I'll I'll uh, drop one of the NFTs and each one with exclusive content. So I love I love that you're merging like sort of the, the benefits of a special edition Blu-ray and all the special features and the extras but it's also limited and and it's also uh, you're in control of it you, in terms of how it gets distributed and obviously as a legal professional you understand this um what i also love is you're working with a traditional publisher so you're bound by the contract you have with them but you're creating content that is not part of the contract it's your ip right that's right that's right yeah a little bit of a workaround i mean being, being creative here um but you know that is well. This isn't a. This is a good topic for for, for traditional publishing, um, a, um, a show, but not for today. But if you if you are getting published by a traditional publisher in the future, um, those NFT rights will be uh, on the table for for negotiating. Which could just be a higher advance uh, or other, other better terms if you if you're willing to sign that over. No, I, I love that. Yeah. And I love that. So the book launch is on the on the eighth, but you're starting things off doing stuff the first, the seventh. And again, it's all virtual over at um, tishamorris.com. People can check out uh, the details there. Yep. Uh, thank you for, for getting into that with me. Uh, also on your website, you had other other courses, which I thought were fascinating because you, you were talking about nonfiction books earlier and memoirs. And you even have a course uh, called Your Book is Your Business to help people who have expertise who want to share. Okay. Yeah, that, I love that course because it really um, gives you a side-by-side um, uh, comparison of traditional and self-publishing. And you know, I have a foot in both, I have a, ra- a horse in both races, and, and appreciate both for different reasons. And so I think it's important for all authors um, to really go through that analysis from the, for themselves and. When you're self-publishing, you have to think like a publisher. You have to think if 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 you're wanting to get traditionally published because you want um, you want them to do all these things, you're going to be doing all those things yourself, <laughs> like um, regardless of which which path you go. And so, with the um, self-publishing, um, 
you, um, you are your own publisher. And so that, which comes back around to these legal issues um, that might be up for you um, because as the, as the publisher, you, you are also, like I mentioned, you have to have your, your own uh, legal, <laughs> uh, legal team, so to speak. Um, and courts, you'll be glad to know, Mark, that courts have, some courts have ruled that the uh, self-publishing, the middle middleman, like you guys are off the hook for legal issues. Congratulations. <laughs> Our CEO will be very happy to know that. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> but are there, um, I guess when, when authors are self-publishing, they are the publisher, therefore they're responsible as the business mm -hmm. owner, et cetera, in control of everything, yep. uh, which is great and scary. But they're signing contracts with distributors like Draft Digital, or if they're publishing direct to the world's longest river or any of those platforms, they're actually, they're, entering into a legal agreement that they agreed to, correct? And, yep. and do you find, do authors actually ever really read those things? Do they attend to them? Are the things they need, to, should be aware of? What, like, what what am I offering? What am I giving them? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I, and I've self-published to um, to the Long River myself, and um, I've never really read any, now that you mentioned it, I think, I don't think I've ever even read anything. <laughs> Well, I'll share because I had to read them word by word and uh -huh. create one for one of the platforms years ago with a smart lawyer. Who I just put it into English uh, and they helped me with it. But I mean, one of the things is they you're not giving up your right. You are you are allowing the retailer the opportunity to sell your product on their site and they reserve the right to not sell it if they don't want to <laughs> for, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the genre topic, different countries have different cultural laws in terms of what can and can't be shared. Um, so so that, that's kind of intriguing. You also, and, and, I, and I don't mean to keep diverting, but there's so many fascinating things that you do. And I was really curious in particular as a, as a cluttery person myself that you, <laughs> um, you have done and written and, and you're an expert on decluttering. And is, is there a way that decluttering can help authors? And then the other thing is, is there a way that decluttering can help authors see the legalities of the things they may be missing because there's so much mm. noise, so much static in the way? Well, I, I think of um, decluttering as far as, uh, yeah, I, I, in fact, this is this is kind of how I came up with the five elements of process or th that, that cycle already exists. It's thousands of years ago and thousands, so I didn't come up with it. But as far as applying it to the creative process, because it's in that metal phase, um, whether it's um, in this, this, these processes show up in, in our daily life. It's, it, it's the cycle of, of our day from waking up to going to the bed. It's the year long process of winter leading to the seasons. And, and I'm mentioning this because there's always an editing phase. And, and so as I was teaching these concepts, I had a feng shui school. And so I, I taught these concepts to students. And while I was teaching these concepts, I was also writing books. And so I started to see how it mirrored my book writing process. And so the editing part is the cutting back. It's like the 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 energy, the 80,000 words have reached its peak. And now what does it need to be in there? What what is just taking up space? What is not furthering the story or the information along and just taking up space? So it's the same metaphor in our actual physical space. What does it need to be here? What's just taking up space? And that's how I think of as clutter as well. What's, um, what's no longer uh, serving any utility um, uh, for me? And thinking about our books in that same way. So in the editing process, I, I do approach it just like I would decluttering out a room. I, I love that because I was only thinking about the mess on my desk. I wasn't thinking about the mess in my manuscript. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're getting close to, I'm going to bring up some questions uh, from the live audience and thank you guys for asking your questions. Remember, we have uh, we have a lawyer in the room who can answer some questions that you may have about it. So the first one, it kind of goes back to a little bit of what we talked about. This is very specific. Uh, so, and, and I don't have my reading glasses on, uh, so I'm going to butcher the name. I'm not going to be able to pronounce. So I'm just going to say we have um, a, a lovely viewer who's asked, am I okay in quoting from a newspaper article about the St. Ma Valentine's Massacre and, and Al Capone, I guess, as, as an example. All right. Thank you for the question. Um, so I do have to do a, a legal disclaimer real quick that, um, that my answers are not, um, are not uh, are just opinions of, um, based on uh, general information and not legal advice. 
Um, so uh, quoting from a newspaper article, yeah, you're that would that would be fine if you were actually basing an entire book from a news article, that would not be fine, which I know that's not your question, but I just want to elaborate on that. Um, uh, so yeah, quoting from a newspaper, that would be the same as quoting from um, a, a magazine article uh, or even another book. So again, you just don't want to like, you know, like cut and paste the whole article and put it in your, in your book. Um, that would be, go over the limit so to speak and that limit there's no it's 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 a it's a gray area as 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 is most things in law but um but like you know a sentence or two quote from a news article and citing that news article you're fine i have to say as an author who has traditionally published uh, true ghost stories or real hauntings books i'll often refer to articles about incidents and then quote them and obviously identify the source that it was published in you know the may 27 1987 issue of this newspaper this magazine and then and, you know attribute the quote so that people know where i got it from uh, but again yeah you're not doing the whole article nice, yeah, and that, nice uh, quotes that add texture to the story that's another great example of it was a self publishing self publisher being your own publisher because when i because i have had the opportunity to work with traditional publishers they are so like at least my publisher is so nitpicky about all of those sources like they they make sure and like verify these sources very carefully because um and so as, as writers or excuse me as publishing authors we need to do the same thing and really do our due diligence and in, in quoting and uh, getting those sources right uh i would just caution authors um i when i when i handed in my first manuscript to a publisher i had all my sources and at the very end of the manuscript i said and i use these sources and then my editor said no and and, and we went very academic with the little the, 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 the end notes and and so even the later manuscripts they didn't require me to put end notes in but i said no i'm going to do the manuscript with the end notes and if you want to take them out it's way easier to take them out than it is for me to go back because i had to go back and get yeah, library books yeah. out again and and get the page number you know, this yep. is from page 26 of this edition of the book. Um, and that, so just advice is better start with more and take it out than it is to try to put it back in later. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, that was a lot of extra work I had to do. <laughs> so, uh, another question is coming in, uh, this one from Kit. Kit says, I'm writing a memoir about my university days uh, 30 years ago. There's an anecdote about my final year project partner letting me down by delaying his work. I don't mention his name. Is this okay? Um, that's a great example. Um, so is he identifiable? Um, probably he's identifiable um, either actually by himself. He'll probably like, oh, he's, he's, he's talking about me or your other friends around that time of like, oh, he's talking about so-and-so. So not mentioning someone's name legally doesn't matter. Now, within our relationships and the way that people, how people think it does matter. So like on, a, on an emotional level, it does on the legal um, level, it doesn't. So a lot of times people just, um, they, a lot, a lot of times people don't know the, the law either. Like, Oh, well, he didn't mention my name. So I guess, you know, he's fine. Um, so it does help, or you can change the name that, that would definitely help. And that would go a long way of showing that you, you're trying to keep someone's um, identity private. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth doing. Uh, now, if he still wanted to, you know, um, cause you problems, he could. Um, but really, you're not, this is kind of an opinion, your opinion that he let you down. So it's, it would not go to the, in my opinion, it would not go to the extent of defamation of mean, meaning it's not truthful. Opinion is okay. And the more, uh, the more as a writer, you put things from your, um, in the, uh, in, in our world, IMO, in my opinion, um, from my perspective, the more you put things from your perspective and your feelings about something and really make it, this is really in for memoir, um, the safer you are. If you start putting stuff on other people, like he tried to, um, abuse me. So there's a difference in saying he, he, he abused me versus saying I felt 
abused. Okay, it's a very slight nuance, but some courts have held that we own our story. And the more we tell, tell the story from our first person perspective, the safer you are. Okay. So if you felt like you were let down, you, were, you felt like you were let down. Whether he let you down in his IMO <laughs> is for his memoir. Um, so I think you're safe. Whether he could pitch a fit, absolutely. We could, you know, anyone can sue anyone for anything. But my goal is for, for if that were to happen, that um, that it's a uh, that it gets dismissed for for lack of any kind of claim. Now, this is a good time for me to mention there is what there is um, what's called media perils insurance. So if you do think you're treading on on um, um, thin what's the phrase anyway, <laughs> if you feel like you um, it, or sometimes people are even if they know their their work could cross a line as far as um, it's that they know that someone's going to pitch a fit of, about their work and you really are afraid that you're, you might get sued and yet you still want to push forward with what you're saying, then get media perils insurance. Um, it's a way for, for you, even if you get sued, then you have a, a insurance company uh, on your back. Is that available in every state or is it different? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's private insurance. So, um, and I know uh, the Authors Guild part partners with a company that offers it. Um, and there's, you know, all the publishers have all the big, you know, all the publishing companies have their own media perils insurance. Um, and so you as an individual author might consider that if you think you have some tricky areas. It, um, oh, go ahead. I would mention too, I do do um, uh, legal vetting of manuscripts as a service that I offer. Sometimes the media perils insurance want a letter from an attorney. Some do, some don't. Um, uh, so if you do that and you need a lawyer's letter, I can do that. Or if you just want my uh, vetting of your manuscript, I do a, like a whole opinion letter. And then if someone gives you trouble, you can at least say like, look, my attorney says I'm good. Um, that can be helpful. Do you work with Canadian authors too, or I mean, obviously it's going to be American law, and that's that's a much bigger country. Do <laughs> 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 um, you work yeah, with authors outside of uh, the U.S.? I mean, you're obviously um, providing U.S. Uh, experience, etc. Yeah, I'm only versed in intellectual property laws in the United States, and then yeah, I'm not sure where they differ. Um, but if you publishing in the United States, then you're you're kind of putting yourself. Uh, uh, you could get sued in, in the United States. Awesome. Thank you. And then I, I want to go back to, because uh, we were talking about memoirs and, and real people. And so this, this friend from college who let me down that, uh, or I felt let down because we want to, there you go, there you go. My, <laughs> I felt let down by my best friend or whatever. <laughs> so imagine a lot of fiction People are inspired by things that have happened in your real life. So if somebody fictionalizes my back in my college days, my roommate or my my lab partner or whoever it was, I, I guess you could still be in the same hot water, right? Even if it's fictionalized, because that would say still be that I recognize this character. I know who this is based on knowing the author and knowing their experiences, right? Yeah, in, in that in that example, the storyline would need to be, you know, congruent as well with whatever happened in real life. Um, obviously, as fiction writers, we're all inspired by our own life in some way or, or people that we've met or circumstances that have happened. And obviously being inspired by certain things is understandable and will come into your books. But actually, you know, writing about a real event with real people that that took place and the whole thing is identifiable that would then then you're you're right so it would need to be the events and the people are so similar that or that that's like uh no this is actually i identify that was actually your roommate um that you're talking about because this exact same happened the, the the lab exploded and you know whatever <laughs> Um, I have I have put real people in in my novels just to to create that sense of reality because it's set in a in the world we know in the U.S. we know in the L.A. and and stuff like that and uh, Alicia Witt who is a, a independent musician and, and an actor um, I 
she's got some great music and I wanted my character to be inspired by having seen her performance live. And that's a turning point in his life. So it was really important for me to acknowledge how awesome she is. But what I did is I actually sent uh, the scene to her before I published it to get her approval. Because if I didn't have her approval, I would have fictionalized everything <laughs> and changed things up. But she, she actually wrote back and said, oh my God, not only is that awesome, that's exactly what I would have said in that situation. Um, and so I felt confident enough to go ahead with that because I did have that person's uh, approval. Now, also, she was an indie musician, so she still owned the rights to her music. Mm -hmm. So she also gave me permission to. Oh, nice. Yeah. That, that's the one time I quoted from a song because I wasn't going to get sued by ASCAP. Yep. <laughs> right. Um, is that the kind of thing uh, when somebody does that, is it, is it good to have a contract in place or is that sort of gentleman's agreement uh, enough? Um, no, that was a great, that's a great question and great point. Um, so if you're uh, getting a release from people that you write about is always a smart way to go. Um, if there's, if there's quite a bit about someone and you, in whether you change their name or not, um, then uh, getting a release from them, uh, like, again, you can kind of uh, sleep better at night. Um, if the whole book is about someone, then you'd want to get their life rights and that's a legal a legal contract. Um, and again, that helps you sleep at night as well. Um, there was something else you mentioned that made me think of something. Oh yeah. I want to, um, mention disclaimers really quick because as, as self-publishing authors, you do the copyright page in your book. Um, and so disclaimers go, go a long way. So we mentioned in fiction, you know, the characters of change, there's always that, that typical disclaimer in fiction books. But in nonfiction books, particularly memoir, pay particular attention to your disclaimer. And actually, courts have held that disclaimers help. It, it shows that you're making effort to to keep people's um, to to be respectful of people's uh, privacy. And so, um, you can look at other memoirs that are like you know popular memoirs um, and see and check out their uh, their disclaimer and see how they approach things um and you it doesn't have to be all legal mumbo jumbo it can be like uh you know it can be like i've seen in some memoirs like even like almost like like where you'd have uh, the epic um oh shoot what's that the word called uh, the the front matter of a book even a whole page dedicated to you know i attempted to you know keep uh these names private or when i refer to um uh David, it's actually a conglomeration of many people. So you can um, be creative in these disclaimers um, and they and they do help. So especially again, it's that it helps emotionally for the for the people um, and, and it also helps uh, legally as well. I've used um, that the events or the product the have been used fictitiously or something like that. And Nonfiction. Um, every effort has been made. The research, the the sources, etc. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, you can see the language that's being used. There. Yeah, I'm such a uh, geek. Like I, every book that I um, own, which is a lot. Like I love looking at the front matter. <laughs> It's like, I want to see what they, how they did their copyright page. I want to see their, uh, I, I love looking at the chapter outline and seeing, uh, to me, that's like architecture of a house and seeing how they built this house. Um, so as self-publisher is this front matter and the back matter too, where you can throw in some cells, some cell stuff um, is very, very important. And, and if you've never done self-publishing, you, you realize quick, there's a lot that goes into making a book. Um, I do have to pop up a comment from my colleague, Kevin, who is somewhere at the same resort preparing to go on stage live. Uh, and he says, hey, Tisha, sorry I missed you. Great interview, though. We'll chat again at the next F F uh, SFWC. I uh, miss you too, Kevin. Wish you were here. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was such a fascinating interview viewers where they can find out more about you online and your forthcoming uh, book launch, et cetera. Oh, thank you. TishaMorris.com, um, T-I-S-H-A Morris.com. My legal website is actually MorrisEntertainmentLaw.com. You can get there from TishaMorris.com. Uh, it's 
your one-stop shop. Uh, you can take that quiz or pre-order the book. Um, I'd love to see you on my NFT day. And um, and yeah, feel free to reach out. You again, uh, Tisha. Thanks for putting up with my technical glitches and, and holding the show while I disappeared. <laughs> Thank everyone uh, for watching. <laughs> All right, you have a great day. Thank you so much.